Hello friends, greetings from Los Angeles, California. My name is Juan Sarmiento, and I thank you for joining this workshop on the subject of Beyond First Impressions, from Trips to Transformation. One of the significant elements in the lives of our congregations in the United States that have been affected by uh, COVID-19 is the area of short-term mission trips or vision trips or visit to partners in other parts of the country and of the world. I'm not sure where you were when you realized that this pandemic had a direct effect not only in the news that we read or that we watched, but also in how we did church. In my own particular case, I was in the city of Franklin, Tennessee, getting ready to take one more group of wonderful Presbyterian people from different states to visit with uh, the National Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Guatemala and some of the relationships that the Outreach Foundation had developed there over the years. I think all of us can relate to the uncertainty of wondering what measures to take in order to prevent unintended consequences to the trips, both for the partners and the participants. Also, the question of whether to cancel or to postpone, and if uh, the decision is postponing, when to postpone it for. Beyond the frustrations of unfulfilled plans, these times have uh, made our congregations value even in a more significant way. The importance of the joint endeavors that um, our churches were able to undertake with the body of Christ in other parts of the world, how fruitful they have been and how fulfilling it has uh, being to work alongside our sisters and brothers uh, from other parts of the world. But also, even more significantly, these times have uh, helped us uh, realize how important it has been for us to develop a sense of closeness, even in spite of the geographical distances, and how we can uh, truly uh, live up to what the Apostle Paul talked about, um, being able to comprehend together the depth and the width of the love of God in Christ as we uh, grow in bonds of friendship that uh, remind us of the unity that we have as God's people. These times, as difficult as they are, invite us to reflect beyond the when. When is it going to be possible for us to return to short-term mission trips, to thinking more about the who. Who gets to be part of God's mission? Who gets to travel? Thinking about the what. And what are the world's problems that we are trying to address when we travel? And how? How are we addressing those problems and those realities in the world? We certainly will not go in depth, but we'll try to provide practicals, uh, practical ways in which we can uh, take advantage of this time in order to go deeper in our relationships and in our mission with the people of God around the world. The question about the who is an important one. Scripturally, we know that all of God's people are called into mission. For some reason, um, oftentimes we think that uh, the mission trips are a privilege of those that can afford it, that are able to either because of our own resources or very effective uh, efforts to uh, do fundraising, are able to participate in those missions. Although that is uh, certainly to be recognized and an important part of it, we go about mission with the resources that God provides. 
Uh, it's oftentimes uh, a reason for forgetting that our own partners, the people that we visit to, that we work with, are also called into mission. And according to the resources that God has provided for them, they have an incredible commitment, oftentimes a uh, uh, passion that surpasses our own, uh, to go into places where God's work is being done beyond their own churches and communities. So as we reflect on uh, the effects of COVID-19 on our mission trips, let us remember that it is not only us who are um, frustrated about the impossibility of traveling, but also our own partners are facing challenges and difficulties, not only because they are not able to receive our visit, uh, but also because they are not able to undertake uh, and to develop personally the relationships that are important for the work that God has called all of God's people into the work of mission. As we consider the who, it is also important to give special attention to who has participated in your trips uh, in the past. Um, the um, pandemic has um, given us a clear sense of the inequities in our society in terms of access to health and education uh, and uh, the justice system and, and many other aspects of our shared life here in the United States. Um, I wonder if it is not also an invitation for us to uh, think of who has had access uh, to the trips and whether uh, you can um, plan on when you resume those trips, including a broader group of people, perhaps people within your congregation or the wider Christian community that um, have not participated. And I wonder if as we budget and, and structure the financial elements of our trip, uh, we could uh, be more intentional about including other people that might not be only able to benefit uh, from the trip, but also give uh, great input and insight um, into the trip from the eyes of people that perhaps are not uh, able to participate in them regularly. One experience that helped me understand a little bit more about our failure to grasp how all of God's people are God's sent people is uh, a visit uh, to the beautiful city of Palenque in the state of Chiapas in Mexico. Uh, last year I was there uh, sharing uh, with a church, uh, with Presbyterians in that location. And while being there, I came to the realization that there was a need within my family that required uh, me to wire some funds uh, from where I was to um, uh, Spain. Uh, and in order to, for us to, in Spain, uh, acquire, my sister acquired some medications that were not available in Venezuela, where my dad resides, where he lives, and uh, where uh, access to that particular medication was a problem. I know... Uh, this is a story that involves uh, several countries at once, but something that I want to highlight is the fact that first we can accomplish so much when we uh, see ourselves together, uh, regardless of the, uh, our locations. Uh, we can do amazing things and need needs and express Christ's love. But another. Uh, thing that I wanted to highlight of that experience is the fact that when I went to wire the funds, um, most uh, locations um, will say, that we're sorry, we are not equipped for sending funds. We receive funds that are sent from the United States and other parts of the world into Chiapas uh, for uh, relatives there. And at times, um, our view of the church is uh, one that uh, highlights the fact that only certain people are senders and other people are receivers. And sometimes our categories, our mental, mental categories, are not prepared to recognize that people in Chiapas have the ability to also contribute uh, in, in very significant ways to God's work in the world. 
And um, as they are, uh, I'm aware of the fact that uh, they have been involved in the sending uh, of, um, of, of mission workers to places in the Middle East uh, and other countries in Latin America as well. At times, we have uh, seen ourselves as the only ones that are equipped to share and to be actors in God's mission and um, oftentimes neglected to recognize that others can also send not only to us, but to places of need and opportunity around the world. So again, let us take advantage of this opportunity to find ways to recognize that uh, the people that we visit uh, and the people that we have developed relationships and partnerships with are people that are being sent by God and uh, structure our trips in, way that, in ways that seek not only to support them, but also to join them in the missional efforts and initiatives that they have undertaken under the guidance of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Thinking about the what is the problem that we seek to address when we travel, is uh, very important. And this pandemic sheds some light on uh, certainly the dilemmas and the challenges of our um, life as fellow human beings and members of the body of Christ. The trip uh, that I coordinated prior to the one that I was planning for Guatemala uh, was one to China. And um, we were there with a group of Presbyterians around the end of October and the beginning of November of 2019. And then in, the, in December, when we heard about um, this mysterious virus that was spreading in, in Wuhan, uh, we contacted uh, one of the pastors that uh, we have developed relationships with there. And um, uh, I was able to put uh, some of the participants in the trip in contact with him in spite of uh, the, the time differences and um, uh, talk about um, life uh, in, in, during the quarantine and uh, this whole situation that seemed to be so bizarre and at the same time so foreign. The reality is that COVID-19 has uh, made us realize how interconnected we are. A problem in China, in, in this global village, uh, is not only a problem in China. It's a problem that concerns us all. A pro the problem that we face uh, in our communities has uh, also a direct effect on the realities of people in other latitudes. We are the body of Christ. And even as Dr. King reminded us, we are all interconnected in this network of relationships. Because as he said oftentimes, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The information that we have been exposed to surrounding this pandemic has reminded us of terms such as, as effectiveness and efficiency, and also confronted us with our own failures to accomplish the things that we had originally set out to. I know that in terms of the good practices of, of, of mission trips, um, many of our congregations have determined uh, or assessed them um, in terms of whether what we originally set out to accomplish was accomplished. And that is a good practice. Um, many of us have been open to also the surprises that as we try to accomplish certain goals together, we recognize that in God's grace, um, we were being invited into uh, things that we can't uh, even ask or imagine, uh, things that we didn't expect or anticipate, but God made possible. Two terms that I have often heard uh, mentioned by the scientific community during this 
days has been transmissibility and lethality in relation to the virus. Transmissibility and lethality. And those terms have made me think about our mission trips. Our mission trips have covered a lot of space and taken us to places where we perhaps as a church we're not uh, familiar with. And um, uh, in some ways that resembles uh, the traveling nature of, of viruses. Our faith is a traveling faith. If you think about the correspondence of the New Testament, I think that some of the epistles, uh, the bulk of the New Testament, would uh, be the result of congregations in different parts and Christians in different parts of the, uh, of the world communicating to one another, following up. Uh, perhaps um, if the New Testament were to be written today, uh, it will uh, be based on Facebook uh, messages or WhatsApp recordings or other ways in which we stay in communication with our partners. And uh, that reminds us of the transmissibility of the Christian faith and the fact that our faith is one that is meant uh, to be in ongoing and sustained relationships with God's people uh, in all the parts of the world. But also the element of lethality reminds me that um, very at, at its very essence, mission is about uh, the life abundant that uh, God has made possible to us in Christ. Mission is about, yes, the peace, the justice, the forgiveness, the new life, the joy of the Holy Spirit uh, that, uh, that we get to experience together as God's people. I wonder if when we consider the how of mission, uh, we should uh, not uh, uh, think of both uh, transmissibility, but also in the life-given nature of our work and assess our work and our um, uh, trips and our ongoing relationships in uh, the light of how, not only how far and remote and how many places do we include, uh, but also in the depth of our relationships and our and how our partnerships express and display um, the the essence of the gospel, the reconciliation that has been made possible, and uh, invite others uh, to that life uh, that we have in Christ. Now that we have seen the ways in which the who and the what and the how. Uh, can change our perception of our mission trips uh, from just being trips to being uh, true transformational opportunities. Um, I would like to share with you um, a clip from uh, my friend, uh, Reverend Christy Labarge, who is the executive director of um, uh, an organization called Impact. And it is an organization that focuses on providing people uh, of different generations with um, the training that makes uh, mission trips not only effective uh, in their outcome, but also transformational. And consider it as a possible uh, source of wisdom for your own mission trips. And right after the video, we will dig into five very practical ways in which you can help your congregation be prepared for deeper, more meaningful, and more transformative mission trips. See you then. Hello, my name is Christy Labarge, and I'm the director of an organization called Impact. And our mission is to form, train, send, and follow up with short-term mission trips. One of the verses that's motivated our ministry is the Proverbs 27, 17. The one that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We really believe that short-term missions have to be about 
a mutual learning and contribution, not just the Americans going into another country to give of our gifts and our skills, but to also go and learn from the people that we're working with and come back and use what we've learned in our own ministry context. And so our goal is to get people out of their bubble and put them in a completely different context. And in our case, it's always international context and get them in relationship with people that are completely different from them so that they can learn and they can see what God is doing in those other countries. And our focus is not just the in-country aspect of the short-term mission trips. We focus very heavily on the pre-trip training and then the actual experience of the trip and then also the follow-up of these mission trips. And so in the training, we spend three days with all of the teams together doing uh, different workshops and seminars and activities all focused around learning, um, really learning how to be a learner, where we're going to learn from the people, to learn from our team and to see what God is doing in those places. Um, we focus on being a servant as Christ was a servant and learning how to, in a cross-cultural context, what that looks like to be a servant to another person. And then also we focus on sharing our story and um, we learn about how our story or our testimony is part of God's story and learn how to share that and learn how to be in relationship where we're hearing other people's stories as well. And so we focus really heavily on those three things during the training and to really to prepare them to go on the mission trip. But what we've heard so often from people is that the thing that they remember most about their overall experience and what they've taken with them later into their Christian life or ministry is the things that they learned at that training. And so we're confident that this training provides a healthy short-term mission trip, but it also equips people to serve in their home context when they get back. And then on the trip, we like to think of the, the short-term mission trips of being kind of like a field ed. You know, you've done the, the class work with the training and then you're on the ground in the field seeing how this all works and seeing how God is shaping you into what he's calling you to do when you get home. And sometimes that means people are feeling called into longer term missions and then sometimes it's some other kind of form of ministry at home or just in the Christian life, professional or not. Um, but we provide experiences that are relational. Our, our, our mission trips are not, not usually project based. They're really focusing on what our partner needs or wants from us, but then going in with our main strategy is to work alongside them in something that they're already doing and build relationships and be able to have that mutual learning from each other. Um, because we've worked with our partners for so long, we often can send our teams into very intimate spaces, such as um, really small group prayer meetings and into people's homes, where they really have the opportunity to build those relationships and listen and share and learn from the people and what God's doing in these other cultures. And then when we get home, we have an extensive follow-up program because we know that when you come back from a mission trip, you're super excited and that it can sometimes be like a mountaintop high that you come off of after a while. And so we wanted to harness that excitement and that learning that happens and really continue to develop that. Um, so we pair participants with a one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching program where they meet for the next five or six months after they get back from the trip and they're talking about you know what did you learn what does this mean what is God teaching you what are you continuing to learn because of this experience and what difference is it gonna make in your life and so we really tried to help participants continue to develop what God is doing in their life as a result of that short-term trip because our goal is that they will be forever changed from that experience and that they will take what they've learned into whatever context that they're going to serve in in their Christian life at home. So Impact is based out of Southern California, but we work with churches all over and it's an intergenerational ministry which is beautiful because you can have a team made up of high schoolers, college age, middle age, and seniors that are learning and working together and just forming a beautiful picture of Christ's kingdom. Sometimes churches want to send an entire team on a trip, sometimes churches just want to offer up the opportunity for individuals from their church to join individuals from lots of other churches to form a team. Um, we have six international partners that we've been working with for 
some of them for 20 years. Um, but we also offer training for churches that have their own international partners, but really want some excellent training and follow-up resources. Thank you, Christy. So as I said, I would like to share five suggestions of very practical ways in which you can help your church prepare for a deeper, more transformative missional relationships with your partners. And here's number one. Develop a prayer guide that includes both the needs of your partners and the needs of your church. How about if we were to see this opportunity as one of intentionally developing a resource of let's say a month in which for 15 days or uh, we pray for the needs of our partners and for 15 days we pray for the needs of your own congregation. We could do that in alternated ways. We can include several partners. But the idea is that not only we be praying for our partners, but that our partners be praying for us. I would uh, suggest that you could gather information about the challenges, the struggles of your partners, but also of your own, and commit as, as a community of faith that transcends um, geographical barriers and even cultural and linguistic barriers to be praying intentionally for the for a month. And um, that share of vulnerability, of recognizing that we here as North American Christians don't have it all together, that we are also grappling with these new realities and do, we don't quite know how to go above them, uh, it can deepen um, our relationships in a way that we had not anticipated. Mission is about a calling to share Christ's love with the world. And we do that, crying with those who cry and rejoicing with those who rejoice. These times in which uh, North America and the United States particularly has been faced with its own vulnerabilities is a good opportunity for us to tell our sisters or brothers in different locations, we need your prayers. And so we can share with openness our difficulties and our share reliance upon God who is our comfort and our strength and our very present help in times of trouble. Number two, introduce your partners to one another. Oftentimes our congregations have relationships with more than one partner. And we have one way or another thought that the network of relationships requires that we be at the center. The New Testament presents mission as a reality that is centered around the triune God. So it is not about us. This might be a good opportunity with the gifts of technology that God has given us to help uh, strengthen the relationship of the body of Christ. So perhaps if you have a partner in Latin America and the other one in the Middle East, they could benefit and be as eager and interested as connecting with one another as they will be with our own churches in North America. Yes? then cultural and linguistic differences can be significant, but let's not underestimate the capacity that our partners have to relating interculturally and finding ways of enriching one another and strengthening the work of God by coming closer together. Number three, invest in language learning. You and I know how much churches have invested in building the capacity of partners in many parts of the world, in finding ways of connecting and developing those relationships. 
but oftentimes we have not necessarily done all that great in the aspect of language learning. It is dedicated, sustained work. It requires that we submit ourselves to being corrected. Uh, and that is often not pleasant. Uh, but it, it is a demonstration of humility, a re, of a real desire to serve together with your partners. So one thing you could do is request for your partners to, if they have access to the internet, serve as mentors to people in the mission team or mission committee or people in the congregation as mentors in language learning. If that is not a possibility, there are um, applications such as Duolingo, or you can request and build relationships with uh, people that share the language or and the culture of your partners that reside uh, closer to you to help you as you seek uh, to honor uh, their culture by learning not only more about it, but digging deeper into something as close to their heart as um, the way in which they communicate. Number four, invest in the relationships between your congregation and uh, individuals and communities that serve as bridges. Oftentimes, in order to undertake our trips, we rely on the expertise and the hard work of people that are uh, bridge people, that uh, either missionaries or local individuals, families, uh, help us uh, be attentive to important matters that perhaps escape our own expertise uh, because of their cultural sensitivity, because of their familiarity with the culture of our partners or the location in which our partnership is uh, focused. Um, these are good opportunities to move beyond the instrumentality of our relationships with these uh, precious individuals and perhaps ask them about how they perceive us. We, they have uh, naturally been helpful to us in order to understand um, the, the, our partners and the realities that they live in. Um, <clears throat> it will be perhaps um, as important, and, and this might be a good time for us to hear from them about what in the way in which we go about our mission trips could be improved. a cookbook in collaboration with your partners. If you have participated in mission trips or vision trips or visit with partners, you would have had more than one opportunity to enjoy a time of fellowship over a shared meal. Those are moments that express not only the hospitality that we have received but also the unity that we have in Christ, the coming together, and in more ways than one. Christ becomes recognizable in the breaking of the bread. Perhaps these are times in which you can put some energy into collecting the recipes uh, for those dishes uh, and celebrating the particularities and the richness of the ingredients uh, that are put into uh, those meals, the way they are prepared, and the ways in which they tell the story of the places where we come from. Keep in mind that some of the ingredients that are found in different locations might not be found in others. And that in itself uh, might be an opportunity to dig deeper into how different our cultures are and in spite of that the reality that we are brought together uh, into the body of Christ.
We are the people of God in mission. Even when we cannot be physically present to our partners, we can relate to one another in ways that reflect the true nature of the calling that God has placed upon us. And when I say us, I don't mean exclusively North American congregations, but uh, the people of God with the participation of our dear partners. When I say uh, mission, I don't talk about just uh, the resolution of superficial problems, but uh, the hard work and intense prayer that are necessary in order to tackle the the huge challenges that our world is facing, knowing that we don't face them alone, that we are partners in Christ's mission, and that God is with us uh, to help us shine Christ's light in the world, even in times like this. And that we go about it, not only thinking that uh, we provide easy solutions, but that we are part of God's healing work so that the gospel, the new good news of God's redemption are being manifested far and wide and in, in very life-giving and liberating ways even today. I am truly grateful for your participation in this workshop and hope that the ideas that we have provided can be helpful to you and your church as we continue to participate in God's work in the world. Thank you, and God bless you.